Hey everybody, thank you for coming. <laughs> it's great to see your faces in our store. Um, we really appreciate you coming to these events and for buying our books. Um, it's what lets us keep having, having these events and we love to do it, so appreciate it. Uh, this evening we have the pleasure of hearing from Jean, oh, sorry, from S.C. Gwen, uh, the author of Hymns of the Republic and for today, um, His Majesty's Airship. The life and tragic death of the world's largest flying machine with Greg Seltzer. Um, S.C. Gwen is the author of Hymns of the Republic and the New York Times bestsellers Rebel Yell and Empire of the Summer Moon, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Critics Circle Award. He spent most of his career as a journalist, including stints with time as bureau chief, national correspondent, and senior editor, and with Texas Monthly as executive editor. He lives in Austin, Texas with his wife. Dr. Greg Seltzer received a PhD in modern European history from the University of Kentucky in 2017. His research focused on French aviation and Indochina during the interwar period. Greg currently works with AmeriCorps in Wake County, North Carolina, and will be pursuing a master's in social work at UNC Chapel Hill this fall. We hope you enjoyed the event. Thank you again. And remember, you can get a copy of his master's his Majesty's Airship up front if you don't already have one. Thank you. Can we just start reading? Sure. Okay, so we're going to have a conversation here in a second, uh, and uh, but we thought we'd just lead, lead it off, and I will just read, I'll just read a couple of selected one one um, piece from the very beginning, and then a piece by toward, toward the end. Um, uh, I'm going to put this on a stopwatch, so. When I get to minute like 45, I'm so shutting this down. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, our story begins in the company of the Right Honorable Christopher Birdwood Thompson, First Baron Thompson of Cardington, Privy Councillor, Commander of the British Empire, Peer of the House of Lords, ex Brigadier, ex General Staff, ex Cheltenham, ex Woolworth, ex Royal Engineers, ex a lot of other things. His official title is Secretary of State for air, which has a wonderful Shakespearean ring to it, and is an apt description of what he does for a living. He is also, according to his, doss his lengthy dossier, a talented multilinguist, a devoted Francophile, and a writer of some note. He is exceptionally tall. He has an elevated forehead, a strong Roman nose, but set between frank, wide-set eyes and an understated late imperial mustache. The date is October 4th, 1930. Lord Thompson is traveling this day from London, England, to Karachi, India. Karachi is now in Pakistan, but it wasn't then. By airship, a 5,000 mile single stop journey uh, over some of the Earth's most hostile terrain that no one, Lord or otherwise, has ever made. The idea is a bit crazy in the way that experimental projects often are, but relatively few people in this time and place appear to think so. Thompson must first drive from his London residence in Cardington, 60 miles north of London, a place that sounds, based on his titles and honorifics, as though it might be a Renaissance country estate in rolling pasture land. Cardington is instead a gritty little industrial suburb of the small city of Bedford. Lord Thompson of Cardington has chosen it deliberately as part of his title, just as the imperial heroes Lord Kitchener of Khartoum, Lord Roberts of Kandahar, and Lord Wolsey of Tel el Kabir chose theirs. But instead of a battleground of empire, Thompson is lord of a sprawling manufacturing complex, the center of the exotic world of British airships. He leaves his flat in Westminster in, Westminster in mid afternoon and travels north in his chauffeured blue Daimler with his private secretary and valet, crossing through Trafalgar Square, Piccadilly, and Regent's Park, thence into the gray rolling countryside of Her Hertfordshire and Bedfordshire. They stop for a cup of tea in Shefford. Near Bedford, the Daimler climbs to the top of the hill from which the city and its Cardington suburb are visible on the level plain below. Thompson, who has been deep in his ministerial papers during the drive, asks the driver to stop. He unfolds himself from the car, all six feet five of him, in Savile Row overcoat, Homburg, and neatly folded pocket handkerchief. He crosses the road and gazes over the farmland toward Cardington, where, two miles off, his, his eyes come to rest on an astounding sight. He has seen it before, but never from this distance, and the experience of wonder is the same time every the same every time he sees it. Secured to a hundred eighty foot mooring mast, nose two in a rising southerly breeze, 
floats the silvery object, the silvery form of an object larger by volume than the Titanic, His Majesty's Airship R101, in the vernacular R101. Even from here, there is something, imp something implausible and physical law-defying about, about it, a giant silver fish floating weightless in the slate-gray seas of the sky. One of the largest man-made objects on Earth is lighter than the air through which it glides. The ship is flanked by two equally gigantic airship sheds, so large, so huge they loom like medieval cathedrals over the spreading farmland. Thompson gets back in the car and they descend through the gathering dusk and rising wind to the Royal Airship Works in Cardington. The time is just before 6 p.m. The 777-foot-long, 77, steel-framed, linen-draped, hydrogen-filled airship with 54 aboard is set to leave for India within the hour. Despite his Cheltenham manners and ministerial calm, Christopher Birdwood Thompson is a man obsessed. He has been the driving force behind a scheme to connect the far-flung outposts of the British Empire through the new medium of the air. He has taken firm hold of the National Building Program, whose purpose is to show the world that it can be done. Flying R101 to India will be the proof. R101 is his baby or perhaps more accurately, the spawn of his gauzy, rainbow-inflected vision of a future in which fleets of lighter-than-air ships float serenely through blue imperial skies, linking everything British in a new space-time continuum. I'm going to read a little, a little piece toward the end. Chapter 12, this is the beginning of Chapter 12, The Violent Unseen World. At just after 2 a.m. on October 4th, 1930, well, I should probably preface this by saying, so, um, you know, I, it's not a spoiler to tell you that this crashed, because I say, I say it on the cover. <laughs> so, and on, and on the flyleaf copy, it says that, so it's something that it did crash. Just want you to know. So what I'm, what I'm about to read here is just as that's happening. We're not gonna, I'm not going to go into all the details, though, because that would be a spoiler. Okay, just after 2 a.m. on October 5th, 1930, engine mechanic Henry, John Henry Joe Binks is awakened in his berth by George Short, the engineer of the watch. Short has just left the engine car where Binks works and knows that Binks is late. Binks jumps up from his bunk. Short hands him a cup of hot cocoa and tells him that R101's five engines, including the one Binks is responsible for, are in good working order. Binks' graveyard shift is about to begin. Binks, a cheerful square-jawed square -jawed Yorkshireman who was a member of the heroic crew of R33 on its wild North Sea ride, gulps down the cocoa, then heads aft, traveling about 150 feet along the narrow walkway that runs nearly the length of the ship. He heads for his engine car, where he climbs 10 feet down a rope ladder to where his thrumming nine foot long, two and a half ton, 650 horsepower diesel engine with its enormous propeller awaits him. On his way to the ladder, he passes <coughs> another officer on the other way. At the same moment, engineer foreman Harry Leach is in the smoking lounge. Yes, there's a smoking lounge in an airship. Um, right next to 5.5 million cubic feet of hydrogen. Uh, is in the smoking lounge, which is located on the center line of the airship, aft of the chart room and the wireless room, and below the deck where passengers and off-duty crew sleep peacefully. He sits alone on a cushioned wicker settee, settee against the wall, in a 16 by 12 foot space with asbestos walls and ceiling with his glass, ashtray, decanter, and soda siphon in front of him. The images are resting, a man alone in a small white room, engines droning and clacking somewhere beneath him, above him so many sleepers in berths he cannot see. Though he doesn't know the particulars, the airship that looms invisibly above him is coming up on the ancient town of Beauvais, France. She's running hard against a 50-mile-an-hour wind at an elevation of 1,200 feet, according to later, later statements from one witness on the ground. The wind was violent, and the rain was strong. The wind was coming in gusts, a tempest from the southwest, very strong, but not lasting. The air temperature is 50 degrees Fahrenheit. R101 continues to labor forward, going so slowly 20 miles an hour over the ground that a witness on the ground thinks that she seems in difficulty. She seems, quote, in difficulty. Nor does Leach witness the change of watch, which happens on schedule at 2 a.m. Captain Irwin retires. 
Second officer, Morris Steff, takes command of the ship. The chief coxswain is the handsome veteran, George Sky Hunt, who supervises the rudder and elevator coxswains. In the lounge, Leach, sitting peacefully, feels a massive shift in the unseen world around him. The movement is violent and sudden. In an instant, everything in the lounge is moving, including Leach. He is thrown forward. He slides along the settee and comes up hard against the forward bulkhead along with his table, ashtray glass, and other glasses, and his soda siphon. Because he is in a sealed chamber with no view on the outside world, he has no horizon lines, no landmarks to tell him what is happening to the ship. But he can feel the ship drop away. The airship is in a dive. A dive. He tries several times to get to his feet. He has the strong sense, as he says later, quote, we must have dived a considerable distance. He finally manages to stand and realizes that the sealed container he is in is leveled out. The crashing sounds have stopped. He drags the table back into position, picks up the glasses and soda siphon, places them back on the table. And for a moment, and that moment will not last long, everything again seems right with the world. All right, and now on to our conversation. So, first of all, uh, Mr. Gwynn, I'd like to just say congratulations on finishing this book. I know this isn't the first time you finished a book, but um, I know it, all, it must be a great feeling to get this type of project done. Um, it, it is, and especially so, because it had a characteristic that none of my other books did, was that when I, so I, I started this, I got the contract for this to do it. Um, just as we were tipping into COVID. And so immediately for the next two years, I mean, I'm a guy who, so this is a history, right? I'm not interviewing current time people for this. So I, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I access libraries and collections and that's what I do, documents and historical things. And uh, I, every single library, archive, collection, museum in the world was shut. In the world, there's nothing open from my local library to the United Kingdom National Archives, where I spent a lot of time later. But so year, a couple of years went by when I, I was unable to do what I normally do, and it was a hard road to hoe. And I, I, I came up. I mean, all I, can, all I can say is I came up with a lot of workarounds. I was very aggressive digitally, and I'll just tell you one story. This is a workaround. I got. I was in touch with these airship guys in England, who are very eccentric and wonderful people. And they have spent, in some cases, lifetimes researching airships and being in archives and museums and things like that. And so at some point, I talked to this guy, and he was sympathizing with me. He says, he says well, Sam, I'm really sorry that you can't get to your, you know, the, the archives. Or he says, but I'll just send a little something to keep you busy. <laughs> this is this guy. <laughs> this great guy, actually. So, and so he sends me these zip files. So they contain... Seventh, okay, so what we do in archives a lot of times, you know, we, uh, a researcher uses a cell phone, uh, sometimes a camera, but you can just go click. You have a page or a document you want, and you go click, right? As you know, click. And that's a page, and that goes in a folder or file somewhere. He sent me 7,000 of those from the United Kingdom National Archives, which is a wonderful place where I tell, I tell people that it's where King Arthur's pipe and slippers and Robin Hood's tights are. Um, <laughs> everything in there from Roman times forward. It's, it's great. Um, but he sent me 7,000 of these. Click. And, and because he's a, a little bit older, it's not always totally organized. I mean, he's not, not that I'm not old, but I mean, we're all old, and it was a little, he was a little careless sometimes in saying exactly where things went. Um, but so I get this, and it, I then spent the next two months, or it was, it was two months, reducing that, because I had to figure out what everything was, for one thing, and make sure wh where the sourcing of it was and where it had come from the archive. But I, I reduced it then to a 750-page sub-archive, which, which for, for my own use, that was quite well-indexed and, um, and organized. Um, and, it, and that... 750 pages contain some of the 
absolute crown jewels of what I was looking for. I mean the crown jewels. Not all of them, but some of them were in there. And Peter had just sent it to me. He just said, here, have this zip file. Anyway, that was a really long-winded answer. I'm sorry. <clears throat> but that was researching a book in COVID. Now, eventually, and I'll just stop. I'll, I'll say one more thing and I'll shut up. What normally the first thing I would have done was would have been to go to England. Would have get a plane and go to England. But I didn't, couldn't do that. So I worked and worked and worked and all these workarounds and read and did all this stuff. And so by the time, finally, I could go to the United Kingdom National Archives in Kew, a little bit southwest of London, um, I knew every, I knew, I, it was, they were all rifle shots. I mean, mm -hmm. instead of the shotgun blast that I would have been doing, I knew exactly what I would have I knew, I knew the day and the hour of the memo that I was looking for just because I'd been working so hard on it for two years. Anyway, as I did eventually go and I spent a number of weeks and I traveled all over England and, and I did do that research, but uh, it was the hardest, it, and COVID, and I want to say I'm the only person who did this, I think a lot of people I know in, my, in the business of nonfiction books had the same issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. And since I was actually going to come back to or ask a, a related question about working during COVID, um, but I've uh, makes sense to ask it now. Um, you know, it's it's clear what the challenges of completing a book project like this was during COVID, and it seems like at least one of the you know one of the, the positives of this was having such a, a very you know kind of like laser focused uh, idea of where you were going to go specifically when you did get the chance to go to England. So um, I guess my question is, do you feel like this writing process during COVID, um, is that going to inform or has it informed how you think about future projects? And that's one question. And the other one is what um, types of opportunities, and this, they're sort of related, what, what types of opportunities did COVID present for, um, for your writing and research? I think it was, uh, well, that's, those are interesting questions. Will, will, will I do something different now? than I have done before. I think it may reorder, um, I think I may spend more time up front before I go to an archive. Mm -hmm. Because I wasn't just at the UK, I was at Brooklyn's and I was at the RAF, which is really cool, so spit fires all around you, very cool. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, think, I think in retrospect, for example, in my book about Stonewall Jackson, when I came, I came here, I was at the Duke and I was at UNC, which both have spectacular Civil War collections. Um, that was perhaps too early. I shouldn't have gone. I was, I was, I was, I was kind of feeling my way in the dark. Mm -hmm. So I think in that sense, yes, I, I would, I would change. I would change the way I, I approach it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, you know, you, you brought up some of your work with like um, on Civil War history, and then some of your other books um, have dealt with more like. Amer generally American history up to this up to this up to this book. point so um, I guess how did you decide to write this book well there's a simple answer to that question so uh, by, by, by way of preamble um, the, these days to me it seems like ideas are the coin of the realm and what we do I mean it's so it's it's harder and harder these days to find an idea that somebody hasn't done that wasn't true in 1970 it wasn't true in 1980 I wouldn't even say it was true in 1990 but the internet has changed the world. It's like every schlump writer sitting at a desk <laughs> anywhere in the world can access the world of everything about everything. And we all know that. I can find out if I have an idea that maybe I want to do something about, you know, a, a, an airship or anything. I can find out everything. I can scour it. I can find out who's done what. I can even find out what's currently being done. And and you this phenomenon you see over and over again, which you see, let's say, a story that... Uh, originates in the early 20th century. You'll see a book here and there in the 20th century. Not a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you have, God, I swear, in 1970, you had a, I, would, I would have had free access to everything. Just pick any biography you wanted to. Mm -hmm. Anyway, then this peculiar mm -hmm. thing happens. You look at the publishing history on the subject. Uh, and we were just talking about uh, David Grant's new book, Wager, which, which I just bought, about the shipwreck in the 18th century. People are wondering, how did he get onto this story? Well... So it turns out there are five major books since 2014 on this subject. Um, this is what you see all the time, is you see nothing, 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 nothing. And then about 2000, 2000, early 2000, you start to see 
And in a lot of cases, you know, there, suddenly there will be seven or eight books on something that, you know, apparently nobody was that interested in the 20th century. Anyway, but for, so for that reason, an, an idea that you, if you have an idea that somebody else doesn't have or an idea that is not widely known, it really is it's worth something. It's worth something to me anyway because, you know, as I speak as someone who wrote a biography of Stonewall Jackson and, and I don't think I was the first person ever to think of writing about Stonewall Jackson. I could be wrong about that. <laughs> anyway, I, 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 but I aspire to do ideas that people don't. Anyway, um, here's the deal. So there is this wonderful historian of the British Empire named, well, his name was James Morris. Did any of you know James Morris? Name was James Morris. He, he, um, he became a trans. He changed his name. Uh, the first major historian, as far as I know, who is a trans person, He's, he uh, became Jan Morris. Um, anyway, under the name James Morris, he wrote a three-volume um, uh, history of the British Empire called Pax Britannica. It's just flat brilliant. It knocks me down. It's just as good as anything I've ever read. Um, and uh, uh, in the third volume of that, which is the crowning, which is called Farewell the Trumpets, which is, of course, the, kind of the end where the British Empire goes down. It's one, the one with Churchill in it. It's the one with post-World War One, World War II. In that book, there's two pages, I think, on three pages, maybe, on the R101 story as kind of this this ship where Britain was trying to kind of save itself as it was as its empire was going down, it was trying to save itself. It was trying to regain its mastery of technology and, and in a way that reminded people of its mastery of the seas. You know, Britain had you know the, the symbol of, of of British power was like the greased piston, the pounding piston, the world's biggest ships with the biggest guns. And nobody could challenge England in her island fortress, right? I mean, they were the greatest power in the world for a long time. And part of what R101 was was an attempt, attempt to populate the, the skies with this British technology and British airships. And this was the point. This was just this little three-page section. And the, I said, wow, what a great story. Oh, that's such a great story. I said, I'm sure it's been done like 20 times. And so I did what all highly trained historians do, is I Googled it, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, the only serious book was done 40 years before, and it, it was by a person who I wouldn't call a professional writer, and there, there's really nothing, there's, there's a lot of airship stuff, but hardly anything on this, and certainly nothing of any value for, well, more than 40 years. Um, so it was an open field for me to run in, and it was it came out of this book. I highly recommend if any of you like histories of the British Empire, or you know you like say Andrew Roberts or someone like that. Um, I, I mean, check out check out James slash Jan Morris. Flat brilliant. Also wrote about eighty other books. But. <laughs> okay, and um, <clears throat> I, I find this you know lack of you know attention on the crash of R101 pretty startling because, you know, as, as you yourself have pointed out, there's just not a whole lot available. And this is especially stunning to me because, you know, given the immensity of, you know, the size of the ship and just the, the, the media coverage, as you point out, worldwide, yeah. like the, you know, first real, or one of the first real mass media events as you say, with like the development of like wireless radio and things like that, um, it's just it's creepy. I don't know if it's just that this wasn't as um, I don't know like there wasn't as many people who actually saw the crash like, take place as in the case of like the Hindenburg or or, or something else. It's interesting as you and I were talking about before. Um, to some extent, it's history that has been overwritten by other things, uh, big things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for example, the first east to west crossing of the Atlantic was done by an airship, British airship. It was a Zeppelin knockoff, 1919. You guys have never heard of R-34. It was an astounding feat at the time. I mean, that's, you know. And what, and what overwrote that? Lindbergh, eight years later, right? Even though what R34 did was, in many ways, I mean, it was equally as dangerous and equally amazing at the time. So it's overwritten by that. Um, 
it was overwritten to some extent by the Hindenburg because that's the one everybody's heard of. <clears throat> and, um, and because nobody else saw the hydrogen fireballs, one of the problems with airships is that they all went up in hydrogen, I mean, huge numbers of them. I mean, 50 plus went up in, in hydrogen fireballs that looked, um, let's see if I can get this, uh, so as long, just as, as a reference point. What am, I, what am I pointing this at? Anyway, as a reference point, um, okay, so this is a reference point. This is 1937, okay? So it's, it, you, and, and, this, uh, there's an interesting story behind this. The, um, at the time, there was a guy from uh, a, a film company uh, called Pathé who shot the famous footage that you've seen, right? But that was silent footage. There was also a guy with AP Radio whose voice was saying, oh, the humanity, right? Those are separate events. They're not the same thing. The silent film of that Prey played in every movie theater in America, but there's no sound with it. So some enterprising British producer later on, I think it was in the 60s, married the two together. Mm -hmm. Finally put the sound with the thing. And that's what we, we all know. Um, but R101 looks, looked exactly like that when she went up. It was roughly the same size. Um, but nobody saw it. Nor did they see all of the Zeppel, German Zeppelins that went up in flames in World War I. Nor did they see all the other, uh, somewhere between 50 and 70 of these that happened. And so what happens is you get kind of this image of the Hindenburg, which again kind of overwrites up, everybody forgets about, well, let's say the <clears throat> two giant American airships, R-101, R-30, any number of airships that crashed before it. We don't, we've never heard about it. And the final thing I think that overwrote the airship era in history was the fact that airships just lost to fixed wing aircraft. They just lost the fight. And early in the 20s, you could have said, you know, this was kind of a, people never really saw airships like this as short range um, travel, um, as for short range travel. They always were for long range travel. But, you know, these things could, the thing about an airship is it could stay up for, um, I mean, it, it could go 2,000 miles without refueling. Um, it doesn't, they didn't go very fast, they went maybe 60 miles an hour, but they kept going for 24 hours. So you could go and you could cover, cover enormous distances. Anyway, I, I want to get rid of the Hindenburg. My book isn't about the Hindenburg. In fact, in fact, my, my, my story, it's a more lethal crash. It's a much better story. The Hindenburg, still, the Hindenburg story was really, it was like, well, what made it go down? And my story is a whole story of the end of the British Empire with all these people in it. It's a better, it's a better story than the Hindenburg, and as uh, we were saying, I was saying the um, it has the great advantage of um, uh, being almost entirely unknown. Um, so I wanted to do one more before we go on, Greg. So on the left, I was talking about all these hydrogen fireballs because what happens and a spark hits hydrogen, especially two to five million cubic feet of it, it goes up in a gigantic hydrogen fireball. Um, the the first big series of them went up, that's, that's, a, that's a German Zeppelin over London where the searchlights have just found it. That's a photograph, believe it or not, and, uh, and the fighter planes are about to go up trying to shoot it down. On the right is one in flames um, coming down, but uh, anyway, I'll go back. There's Lord Thompson, who I was reading about. Just, I'm sorry, Greg. I'm just no, it's okay. I'm trying to. I'm trying to click through these things. These normally accompany a speech in an order, but since we're not doing a speech, anyway, there's our 101 over London, and you get a sense of the scale of the thing. We're probably flying at about 800 feet over London. You get a sense of how big she is. So go. On, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, you, I'm digressing oh, and digressing from my digression. Um, so of course you, you you mentioned the zeppelins, the zeppelin range in World War One, and um, as you make very clear in the book, you know the development of German Zeppelin technology was you know, critical. It really informed what the British did eventually uh, with R-101 and also their airship development uh, before that. Um, given how um, you know, the, the British were, you know, of course, in conflict with you know, Germany in World War I just a couple short years uh, before um, uh, you know, 
British rigid airships are being, you know, because they're like R101 and R100 became or were being constructed. Um, what was the the pull of this German technology? Why why use something you know from an from an enemy that you had just defeated after a long war? It's a really good question um, because a lot of this was sort of German envy. Um, I have to give you a little back, guys, a little bit of background. Um, so in 1900, these are just pictures that I want to know. Let's, let's go forward. To, let's find our little guy here. Okay, around 1900, this Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin invented a thing called a rigid airship. You know, now this was not a balloon and it was not a blimp. It was a steel structure. Um, and one of the problems with balloons and blimps was they, they couldn't hold very, they, they collapsed upon themselves so they couldn't hold very much gas, therefore they couldn't lift very much. So von Zeppelin mm -hmm. built this enormous steel and duralium and frame with big transverse girders and frames and everything else in order to hold these giant gas bags which would then be able to lift a lot. Um, and he, this was, this is, that's the first one, uh, went right down in the lake. Um, this one here uh, was the, really changed everything. It went, even though it went down in a hydrogen fireball, just like the Hindenburg, and just like so many of them did, um, it had at one point flown for 12 hours, which was longer than anybody had done. Uh, the Wright brothers were at 38 minutes at that point. Um, so he was sort of rewarded by an instant GoFundMe campaign of $30 million. Um, but the reason, and the interesting thing about von Zeppelin, and we'll get to uh, answer your question in a minute about R101, but so the, what was the purpose? Why did von Zeppelin, what did he see? What was, what was this going to do? What was the purpose of having all this lift? Because when I mean, look at it, inside that thing, that thing is 550 feet long, and it's full of just chock full of hydrogen in these gas bags. So what was the point? Was it to, uh, for a passenger airliner? Was it for a, um, a cargo company? No. It had one purpose, one purpose alone. They were weapons. He never saw them as anything else. They were, they were, they were weapons of war. They were meant to be launched against European cities to set them on fire and to destroy them, to kill innocent civilians. Literally, that was, that was the point. And there was this wonderful little song sung by, if I can get the lyrics right, um, sung by German school children just before the war. And it was, fly Zeppelin, fly off to England. England shall be destroyed by fire. <laughs> cute, cute little German kids, you know, I love them. <laughs> uh, but it was, it was, that was, they were weapons. They, and, and indeed, in World War I, they were unleashed on seven cities. Most of them went against England as they were the world's first long-range bombers. They were the world's first weapons of mass terror. People have forgotten this. I think most people think that you know the Germans bombed, uh, you know, London in World War II, which they did. They bombed it in World, in, in fact, all over England. Um, and it was technology that I think is what you were suggesting here is that it didn't really work very well. I mean, yes, they had all of England terrorized, um, but these things were really hard to fly. They had enormous. So let's say you have five acres of surface area, very hard. Let's say a 40 mile an hour wind hits it, it takes off like a big sail. Hard to navigate. Um, and <clears throat> of course, they had this problem once the British figure out that, that if you shot an incendiary bullet into one, it would go up. Um, so, really, it, you'd have to say that the war effort by the Germans was a total failure. The Zeppelins, in total, killed less people than one. U-boat torpedo aimed at the Lusitania did, just to put it into perspective. And a lot of their bombs, I mean, there was a whole squadron of them one night that couldn't find London. London's the largest city on Earth. I mean, they, they were constantly bombing, thinking they were bombing London or Bristol or Birmingham or Manchester, but actually bombing some farm field and killing melons and a donkey. And, and anyway, these, and a lot of them were blown back across the English Channel. It was really a disaster. So getting to your point, so why, after the war, did the British embark on this a great building program. A lot of it was envy. They just, they never could keep up. The Germans had this technology. I mean, the last of their, of their super zeppelins could climb to 26,000 feet. That was just way beyond what anybody else could do. They had these engines that could propel them at 75 miles an hour. The, Brit the British, the, the most the British could do was to 
copy down Zeppelins, use industrial espionage, literally girder rubbings that people took in the night. I mean, they they, they cobbled together their, their own airships from, you know, from stolen secrets of Zeppelins to try to keep up. But they never really could. Um, uh, I think the, the total number of British, of uh, German Zeppelins, made by the Zeppelin Company, 150, I think. Britain, 17 total of the United States of America, three. I mean, so this is where we are. So one, very few, I mean, this is in an era when thousands of airplanes were flying already. Um, we're, we're in a world, a really relatively small world. So it was envy of the Germans. There was also sort of a myth, I think, of that the Germans had used these things brilliantly as scouts over the North Sea and the English Channel, which was not true. Um, so in effect, the, Brit the British copied this deeply imperfect technology, um, which you know, airships were a bad idea for, from really the first moment that one of them ever flew, and there was hardly anything good about them. Mm -hmm. Very convincing argument for starting an <laughs> airship company. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> which people are doing these days. But so, as I heard you mention earlier, um, it's very clear what's going to happen at the end of this book, right? I mean, you know, I originally thought just a few pages in, but in reality, it's right in the book subtitle. You know, you know, it's it's not going to end in a, in a positive, typical sense. So, um, but what I really enjoyed was that it was. Um, the pieces were there throughout the story. You're thinking like that could be it. It was almost like a game of, I don't know, almost like clue. You could theorize maybe what could cause what it. was going to do it. Right. So, how do you? I guess what I'm asking is, what was your approach to keeping this story going and keeping the reader engaged and bringing in these different elements and filling the holes and making it finally come together, uh, you know, in a crash. But you know, what, how did you? Um, that whole technique, or it strategy? almost kind of, it, in that sense, it almost wrote itself because there was a progression of, of events that almost ordered that for me in, in terms of the way it unfolded, and in fact, hit the ball from the read. You know, it ends up hiding the ball a little bit, so you don't really know what was it that, what was it that, that made it crash. But if we can go back for a second to, um, there's a German Zeppelin over Brazil. Um, if we go back to just this thing here, um, uh, so if you look at it there, first of all, that's I was talking about these these uh, the, the, the steel structure, uh, steel and duralium, which is an aluminum alloy uh, structure of the thing, right? This is you're looking at a 777 foot long by 140 foot high airship um, filled with with these gas bags. Now the the, it is covered with a very, this whole thing is wrapped in linen or cotton, a, rel, a relatively thin, literally just draped over, which you're looking at in the surface area. Now, by the way, in R101, everything's inside there. 8,000 square feet of you name it, kitchens and cocktail lounges and dining halls and 50 sleeping berths, and they're all inside. This first airship ever to do that. Um, but it's covered with this really flimsy linen. I mean, really, you can put your hand through it. Um, and what the linen is protecting, what the incredibly flimsy linen is protecting, are the gas bags, which are made, which are made from what are called gold beater skins, which are cattle intestines. Okay, so imagine, if you will, a sausage casing. I mean, I'll do that, right? Sausage casing. Take the sausage casing now and take sausage casings from like 500,000 cows and glue them all together. It's, it's really gross work. You've got to scrape all the blood and mucus off and put it in chemicals. And the place, where the hole where they did this just absolutely reeked. And they would then spread out these the, the now cured uh, intestine, this cecum, uh, part of the intestine. And then they would uh, glue them all together. And they would put a very thin cotton backing on it. And that's what the gas bags were. They were so thin, I mean, people fall, the tools fell through them, people fell through them. They were, as they billowed and surged up there, they were, and so why, would be your question, why would you ever use that? The answer was that hydrogen is the lightest element in the world. It's, it tends to get out from wherever you put it. It tends to leak like crazy, and so the, the, 
the idea was the issue was permeability, and they're, they're, and in spite of all of the with R one hundred one, they tried everything. They tried every conceivable type of um, you know rubberize this and rubberize cotton and and uh, you know emulsifiers and they couldn't make anything that was as impermeable as an intestine. So what you have? So okay. So now we have this really flimsy stuff on the outside. We have protected. So, so for example, if you if you uh, if you uh, let's say you you tore the is this thing on? It's not even on. Um, so, uh, so for example, if if the cover tore at the at the bow of the aircraft, right, it would expose uh, the gas bags, which can be easily ruptured by wind or rain. So, so what you had, one of the things that you had, because they, as they went forward, starting in 1929 through 1930 for a year, they kept having these terrible tears in the cover, and then the cover would rot, and then the glue they used on it would rot, and the cover, well, was just part of the problem. The gas bags were, they invented these, well, supposedly brilliant, enormous parachute harnesses to, let me see if I can show you one here, uh, to hold these gas bags in. Um, I have to show you the. Oh, where's the gas? There. Okay. So that, whoops, that thing is ten stories high. That's one gas bag. It holds five hundred thousand cubic feet of hydrogen. That's it's it's ten stories high. Okay. That's and it's all cattle intestines, and I think I don't know if you can sort of see. It was they were held in by these. You can see them sort of this, these parachute harnesses. That allegedly kept them off. I mean, if you so, um, oh good, that's what I thought was going. So in other words, you see all these girders around here. These are the girders I was talking about, right? So this is the this, the steel structure of the ship. The whole. So when you're up there flying, what you don't want is this thing to rub on those things. But they were rubbing like crazy on those things, starting in 1929, and then they padded and they put ten thousand pads on these things, and then that didn't work. And then they padded it again, and that still didn't work, and then. I mean, it, it was, so what, what Gray was referring to was that th throughout the book, throughout this process of building her, there was this drumbeat of, of, you know, things that went wrong. The cover tore. Well, they tried to fix it. They tried to glue it. The gas bags kept rubbing against the girders, and suddenly they were losing all their gas. And if an airship loses gas, it goes down. And there was this kind of, and it, and it, and it happened in a kind of conveniently linear way, from my point of view. So I, mm -hmm. I could just kind of describe it as it happened. Mm -hmm. All of the mistakes that they made and all their, their failures to correct this thing and then finally to, to fly the ship to India mm -hmm. with minimal testing and only in, only in fair weather. Mm -hmm. So it was a, um, uh, but it, it was a, so my book at some point, I mean, I knew that I was writing a book about um, airships and R101 in particular, and R and, and uh, Lord Thompson's Imperial Airship Scheme, which was the scheme to populate the skies of the world with British airships and link their empire together and shorten the distances between Australia and England and South Africa and England and all that sort of thing. And as I was writing it, I, I knew that's what I was writing about. That's my subject, right? But at some point, it really came very clear to me that what I was really writing about was human folly on a gigantic empire scale. And I really, it came to me one day, I said, oh, this way, as you say, it's just this, this one mistake after another, which included this conviction that they came to that the thing was indestructible, which was very, very close in some ways to what had happened two decades before uh, with, with the building of a ship called the Titanic. Yes, and you know, bringing up all these different elements. When I was reading the book, at several points, I'd written in the margin, like, "This is it. This is a problem." But there was also this, and this, and this. And one key part of that too that involves none of the actual physical structure is the mentality of um, a lot of the different players involved. Thompson, in particular, his motivation for moving forward with this scheme, but also with other um, people involved, there was this sort of, uh, to a certain extent, people driven again by like real human uh, faults, 
driven by either this, this need to please others or not want to offend superiors or this need to keep everything kind of hermetically sealed at Cardigan. Uh, and just, you know, there were these, all these different, uh, you know, human, very human elements yeah. that, you know, in, that led ultimately in some ways or that contributed to this final disaster. So that I also found, you know, um, very interesting and part of what like drew me in is seeing like how these you know real people really were because that's often you know what can be difficult about writing history because it's you know black and white photos static images it's dusty archives it's people who are you know gone buried done so i i really appreciated that well good so let's take let's take just one person, the human story of why. So, okay, so Lord Thompson. Lord Thompson. Um, I just want to get him up on screen, so come on, baby. So, did I show you that? Did I show you this one already? Yeah, you should. That, did I show you that one? Yeah. That's the women building the gas. Those, those are the animal intestines backed by cotton. They're building them. They're backlit. So, that's how they did it. That's what... The, Okay, I'm trying to find good old Lord Thompson. That's the count. Okay, there's Lord Thompson. Okay, so, okay, let's look at this guy. It's his grand scheme, the Imperial Airship Scheme. He is going to fill, he is going to sort of, you know, Britain after World War I has the largest empire on earth. You know, a quarter of the world's land mass, 400 million people. It's, Britain itself is very shaky as a power, but they've got the biggest empire in the history of the world. And... One of the things they, they, so they come up with this idea, the Imperial Airship Scheme, which is going to, if they can get airships traveling routinely back and forth between India and London and London and Egypt and South Africa and, and Singapore and New Zealand and Australia and all this, this wide world of the British Empire, they could link it closer together. I mean, this will tell you what kind of effect that would have. In the, uh, once, it, once every couple of years, they would have an Imperial Conference in in London, where all the heads of the dominions and protectorates and territories and colonies and everything else would come to London, right? And the guy from Australia or New Zealand, that was a, almost a month at sea to get there. Airships could do it in 11 days, which completely changed the whole space-time continuum of the empire, right? It links it closer together. Suddenly everything, it's instead of 12 days uh, or two, two weeks by, by ocean liner, to India is four days. I mean, everything becomes just radically closer. So he had this plan: populate the the, the skies with airships, British technology, um, and R101 was going to prove that it was going to work. And so, what his plan is: he's got the, the Imperial Conference is taking place in October in London, and what he had decided he wants to do is he wants to fly R101 to India and back just in time to step off the airship with trailing clouds of glory, walk into the Imperial Conference and give the speech about the future of the airship, having proven that it could be done. You say, I just, I just went four days out, four days back from India and this magnificent airship that the British, British technology, this is going to do. And what happened is that the date, which, um, you know, I started my reading was October 4th, 1930. It had to happen, so that's one of the reasons that why it was being, why India, why the voyage to India was being pushed. Another reason was a woman. There's always a woman right somewhere, waiting in the wings. Uh, the uh, the human motivation for why we have to go to India so quickly. There she is. Okay, this is Marta Babesco, one of the great beauties of Europe, a real life Romanian princess, immensely wealthy. She's got two. Uh, palaces, that's one of them. Uh, she is the toast of literary Paris. Marcel Proust writes her poems. Andre Gide and Jean Cocteau were admirers, and she's the thing. Anyway, Thompson, as Romanian, Romanian attache with uh, the British attache in World War I, falls hopelessly in love with her, madly in love with her. Um, and is, he, he's kind of a military lifer who doesn't have any money, so he's constantly trying to impress her. And the reason he gets his cabinet job as Secretary of State for Air is because of his friendship, really, with the Prime Minister. And so 
the India trip, and 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 so for him, India, it's interesting. It, the, he is he is about to be named Viceroy of India as the ship takes off. This is what's happening in the background. Nobody knows about it. Viceroy of India rules over 320 million people, right? including 150,000 people of British origin. Um, he lives in a 240, 340 room, 200,000 square foot palace, which is the largest residence of any head of state in the world. Um, and his summer palace actually is, is like only half that big up in the Himalayas and Shimla. Um, and it's the most important job in the British Empire because India is seething. The Indian National Congress, Gandhi, I mean, he, he, he would be saving India for the British. So this is about to happen. So why does he want to go? Why, why the hurry? To, why the push to get R101 untested with its cover untested and its gas bags untested and all these other things that have had problems that have had with it? Why they have to get to India so fast? Well, I see two reasons. One, you know, the, the, the imperial airship scheme which is his baby, and two, Marta Babesco, who he wants to impress. You know, why do people start rock bands and impress girls? You know, why, do, why do people want to fly airships to India? I don't know why men want to do it, but, you know, they do. And certainly, um, you know, Thompson, of course, had his motivations, whatever they were, um, but, um, you know, there were, of course, also other people whose either sharing of information or lack thereof. Right, the whole organizational side of it. Yeah, so there were a bunch of, you know, again, once again, you can see, is it like, is it this person, this relationship, this, uh, you know, communication that didn't go beyond a certain desk? Was it Thompson? Was it someone else? You know, it's, you know, that's really fascinating because all this sets up that you really, you know, you know exactly what's going to happen, but almost till the end, you're like, who done it? You know, what's it going to be? Uh, so I think that's Which was, of course, and who done it was, of course, a, they had this big inquest after this, because this was one of the biggest national tragedies in British history. I mean, it was on the level of the Titanic. There was I mean, hundreds of thousands of people in the streets, and I mean, there was national mourning. And so who, what caused this horrible thing, right? So they set up this, the, the inquest, the inquiry, and uh, they interview all these people over a three-week period, and then they publish this report, and the and the published and the report's conclusion was, well, no one was to blame. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was yeah, yeah. Lord Thompson rushed it a little bit, maybe, but yeah, it was like, no, no. <laughs> and the reason for that was the tragedy was so raw and so recent that to assign blame was to blame dead people. Mm -hmm. And you know, these people were burned to well, I mean, without getting into it, like burned to it, incinerated to crisps in really gruesome ways. So, so they're almost not even legally identifiable, and 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 to be blaming them, be going, you know, uh, Richie Colmore, you know, who who ran the Royal Airship Works, boy, he he bottled up information and didn't let it get up to the Air Ministry and information that they should have known about, or or Lord Thompson should never have pushed this so hard, or all these kinds of things that you could have said, and yes, there was all these organizational reasons why they didn't listen to their inspectors. I mean, there were all sorts of reasons why this happened, but nobody in the United Kingdom wanted to blame anybody. And even though the, the actual inquiry, they did a fantastic job. They published a 700-page report, which is like the, becomes the Bible of this thing. But, but in their, in their I'm, I'm sorry, not, I'm sorry, the 700 pages were all of the actually physical interviews actually and documentation in place that nobody ever read. They published a much shorter reported the inquiry, which absolved everybody, and, and everybody just went on. So there was never any real blame assigned. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I had the opportunity of assigning blame. <laughs> <laughs> and really, until this was, the complete cause was really worked out and pieced together, that was, how long later? That was... Oh, that was so, let's decades. say, 87 years. Yeah. Yeah. 87 years. Yeah. Um, so very interesting. So nobody knew what happened. I mean, nobody... Okay, all these reasons. I mean, yes, they had trouble with the cover, and yes, they had trouble with the gas bags, and yes, they had they had all these problems, and the ship was untested, and they never sailed it, and they never uh, they they never flew it in 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 bad weather, and they didn't know what was going to happen. So all these reasons that people thought, but no one had ever actually figured out exactly what the cause of the crash was, and I won't go into all the details. It's sort of fun, but they 
the uh, there were theories about so you, because there was a one dive that I described in my reading was that when, when uh, Leach the engine guy experiences the first dive while sitting in the smoking lounge and then, but there's a second dive and they couldn't figure out why there would be a second dive or why the ship couldn't have recovered on and on and on finally so there's this guy this researcher at a British university retired guy who had worked in very high levels of of physics and mechanical sciences and he just he solved it and and this is he solved it in two papers in 2017 neither of which anyone understood because the second paper which was just to be technical support for the first paper the first paper which is where he said here's what caused it but for some reason it was the second paper that got published out in the various places where people would see it and people would read and go, I have no idea what he's talking about. So there was this. So not only did this guy Brian Lawson solve it, but no one ever knew that he solved it. So it gave me the opportunity writing this book to actually present to the world what this really intelligent guy, who I talked to a bunch of, uh, did. I mean, and um, so we solved it. It's it's solved. I mean, I didn't solve it, but Brian did, and I I published his work and. Presumably to a wider audience, but it's a and it's a good tale because there's because what the theory of wh why she crashed grows directly out of all the things that you were saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, the failure to listen to the inspectors, the bottling up of information. What did they relate to? They related to the gas leaks and the failure of gas bags. And I mean all the things that you you can see that they all add up to what happened at the end, which was loss of gas in the front mm -hmm. of the ship. And just to, you know, go, there were so many things that I found just um, very, uh, you know, for me was really um, fascinating about it. So I'm just going to run through a quick list of some of these things. Um, first of all, airships, rigid airships flying, it was, it could be noisy, it was really complex. They're always like, maybe not for the people who were lounging aboard, but you know, adjusting and monitoring and generally just doing things and figure, you know, workers in, in the different engine cars and in the, you know, the control car. Um, and this really contrasted to my idea of like, okay, it's like, I've seen the good one. It just seems like it floats along. <laughs> I know this wasn't the same thing, but just that idea that my impression, and of course, mainly you see still photographs, like you had a couple here, not, not the Hindenburg on fire, but just other ones. They're just kind of floating there, that little cloud just going by. But the reality that looks easy bring to life isn't like that at all. They don't just float through the air. They do the hunting, as you discussed. They go, yep. you know, like move up and down. Yep. And, you know, sometimes they just... They They're don't. also vastly more difficult to fly than, than airplanes. Yes. Well, it's not even close. Uh, anyway, go ahead. Sorry. No, and I was thinking that's just really interesting. Even how they move sometimes. They, like, fly, like, do you say, crab-like movement? Well, because they're so... So if they're... If, they're, if you... If you want to, um, if you want the airship to go, to, let's say to where that camera is there, um, you and you've got a thirty mile an hour wind blowing, I mean you're basically it's that's you're moving like that. Um, you're, you're trying to correct for this. Where in the case of R one one six and a half acres of surface area being hit with the wind is is going to blow you off course. So, um, but airships had there's so many different variables that they had to deal with. You know that. That the, that the lift and the bags were sub subjected to, you know, I mean, were, were dependent on humidity and air density and air temperature. And, um, you know, you had to use ballast. Um, you had what they had called a pressure height, which is that when, you're, when you went to a certain height, the gas bags filled. And if you didn't vent the gas, they would blow up. And, I mean, there were all sorts of very, very difficult to fly. In fact, the Germans, for all the bad things I've said about them, were the only ones who really... <laughs> Excuse me. I just said the word Germans. <laughs> um, anyway, the Germans were the only ones who really ever knew how to fly. And, and for those very reasons. Just, you know, a couple other things, just like the, the danger, vulnerability of, of flying these ships, even the hydrogen. I thought that was the main thing, but that wasn't it. Like all of it, really. It was, you know, the problems, of course, the dangers with hydrogen, but there are other issues that could cause it to you know, crash or, or drift off or a variety of things. And just, you know, frankly, the immense size of everything about 
R101, I'm still having a hard time grasping how large this airship was. And, and you do a really good job in this book, I think, of getting app comparisons. Like, a, you know, a, I, can, I can picture a 10 story wheel of smelly cheese for the gas bags. Uh, like, for example, you, that, that you do an excellent job of that. Uh, but yeah, just the immense size, it's just hard to comprehend. I mean, was that something that you, uh, you visited the air shed? I did. I went to the air sheds. Um, I, I wish I could have gone up in one. I really wish I could. In fact, I, I wanted to go up in a blimp, but COVID <laughs> shut that down too. But uh, so I'll tell you a story of, of these. So you were saying that, yes, hydrogen was a big problem, but it wasn't the only problem. And let me give you a good example of why that was true. The uh, a After R101 went down, believe it or not, the Germans and the Americans had a joint venture between Goodyear and the Zeppelin Company, and they built this ship called the Akron, which was this giant, well, I've got a picture of it here, might as well show it off. Akron was uh, a, a huge ship. There it is in, 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 uh, in Akron, Ohio, coming out of its shed. Um, so okay, this thing was going to solve all the problems. It was uh, helium. One of the reasons that the Hindenburg, <coughs> the, uh, the, uh, the president of the Zeppelin Company, wanted helium in the Hindenburg, but he couldn't get it because it had become a strategic element that the Americans had and only the Americans had it basically in you know Texas Panhandle and Kansas Oklahoma I think um, where most of the helium is but so this thing was full of helium so you think okay well, okay no more danger of fireballs because helium won't do that okay so here's what happens to the shed at the top sorry to the uh, Akron She's being used as a Navy training ship. She's off Barnegat Light in sort of middle New Jersey, off the coast there, and it's, it's in March, early March. And she runs into thunderstorms, bad thunderstorms. Now, one of the problems with something this big, and it, it all has to do with the size of it, this is this one's um, even slightly larger than, uh, than R101, uh, is that a thunderstorm has up and down drafts, and when an updraft hits something that is that big, again, you're talking six or seven acres of surface area, it just goes, I mean, up to 4,000 feet in 15 seconds, and then back down to like, you know, it, 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 so this ship went on this absolutely wild ride through these thunderstorms off New Jersey in March, and illustrating one of the really interesting characteristics has to do with the size, which is that you can't land them in a storm. You can't. So let's say a plane is up in a storm. It can come down, right? It can go down a little runway or down to a field or something. A ship in a storm can go into a port if it finds a safe haven and get away from the storm. They couldn't land. Why couldn't they land? Because at the ground or near the ground, wind would just beat them to pieces. I mean, destroy them. You couldn't control them. You couldn't take, you couldn't hold them down. You couldn't do anything. Just get beaten to pieces, and they did. They often did. And so the Akron, demonstrating this weakness in airships, which has nothing to do with hydrogen, um, is up trapped. And there's this. I describe it in my book, but it's this. It's fleeing for literally four hours from thunderstorms, and it goes offshore and it finds one, and it gets just. It's just getting smashed around. It's going up and down, and then it flees to the west, and it sees thunderstorms there, and it's just fleeing in panic. And eventually it hits a downdraft, and the downdraft slams it down into the, um, whatever it is, 43 degree water, and 73 of 76 people on board die. But that illustrates what you were saying, which is that, yes, hydrogen was what, what ultimately doomed the R101 and Hindenburg and, and so many other airships. But this wasn't hydrogen, and this thing was smashed in, it, well, it, 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 was, it wasn't... What happened was it, it it came down toward the Atlantic. It was it was an up down up down on the downdraft, and as it tried to climb out, its its uh, sort of dorsal fin in the back, its rear uh, the, the stabilizer in the back fell off, mm -hmm. and the thing just subsided into the water. So, but you know, um, its sister ship, the Macon, two years later off California, also went uh, also filled with helium, went down in a windstorm. I mean, you know. That if it wasn't one thing, it was another. Sure. With airships. And even like, it seems like with the most successful ones, they still had problems. Like ones that were deemed successful weren't, you know, without issue at times. I mean, I'm thinking of 
of you know the um, graph. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So the graph set board was was this this drove the British insane. Okay, I'm trying to graph set board. Uh, because the Graf Zeppelin was this one, there was one Zeppelin that actually succeeded in flying around the world and flew to Brazil and flew to Tokyo and flew to the Pacific. Where did it go? Uh, I'm sorry for this. I'm sorry. That, that's the Graf Zeppelin. And this had the, it had a German crew that was the cream of the cream of their. World War One pilots. It was the nineteen twenty. I say the nineteen twenty seven Yankees of airship crew were on that thing, and um, it flew around the world, drove everybody crazy. It was apparently, you know, everybody said, "What the Germans can do it? Why can't you?" In fact, it had uh, it had a reputation for just being this wonderful craft that didn't have any problems. As I chronicle in the book, it had all kinds of close calls, um, some wind related, some hydrogen related, some you know, it, it was. It itself had many, many, many close calls, and, and uh, probably should have blown up like the rest of them. But uh, it, uh, I, w- I don't want to suggest, in fact, that, that that all airships went down in flames. They didn't. So there were, there was the Graf, uh, which was launched in I think 1927. Um, there was the Los Angeles. Uh, uh, a uh, ship that the Germans made in reparations and gave to the Americans that, the, that actually flew for a while. The Germans ran uh, uh, a, a, uh, an airline, in, I think from about 19, I'm going to say 11 to 1914, and they called it an airline, and what they were really trying to do was get military contracts, but they flew, because they were smart, they flew only in summer, only in fair weather, only in windless weather, only, I mean, they, and they only did short hops, and they did most of them, they gave them away free, and they created this illusion of an airline with regular service, which it never was. It's called the lag. Um, so there were these little moments, and so that, for example, the British Parliament could look and go, oh, you know, look, the Germans just ran this, they had this commercial air service for years before the war. These things really work. Well, they didn't really. It was an illusion. Or later, the graph, it just goes around the world. It's kind of, you know, no, it was never that simple. These things are incredible. And it was it was a uh, testament to, to the talent of the guys who flew that thing, that they did what they did. Mm-hmm. Well... Uh, Mr. Grant, I feel like I could sit here and talk yeah, for several days, <laughs> but um, I believe the uh, uh, we're, we're going to leave some time for audience questions, I think. Yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Yes, sir. So I'm curious how you had the narrative of the people in the last hour of the flight. Did somebody somebody survive, or are you just making that up as a narrative? Or? No, okay, so so one of my uh, principles as a historian is I don't make anything up, and I don't <laughs> embellish anything. I mean, and some historians embellish, I think, but, uh, you know, if, if I, if, I mean, I, I don't put anything that I can't document. Um, and so what we have, we have six survivors. Oh. Miracle. I mean... I, the guy I was reading, Harry Leach, Harry Leach is in the smoking lounge. He is saved by the smoking lounge because it's got, it's the first airship ever to have a smoking lounge. And you think, this is funny, right? You have 5.5 million cubic feet of hydrogen just above you, but you're in this asbestos-lined room. Um, so we have, we have, we have the, the six survivors, um, which gives me the ability to narrate the end. Um, now, what I can't do is narrate it as, as, as it was seen from the control car. Because everybody in that died, so I. But these other guys, they were. Um, uh, one was an electrician. Let me see. One was sort of a free. One was an engineer, and then I would say four were were in the little engine pods, which makes sense, right? They were outside of of, of the ship. But uh, yeah, it gave me the ability to do that to create a sense of, of narrative. And again, and I just went through. You know the, the extensive interviews with those guys. Yeah, I was going to ask about uh, the U.S. Navy using airships during the war in anti-submarine warfare, and then it occurred to me that you know those were a blimp, yes, rather than a rigid. Right, and another thing is, I mean, this this subject is endless when you get into it. But in World War One, there were these things. For example, the British they called them battle bags, and they were just these. Um, they were just primitive blimps, you know, just balloons filled up with uh, um, 
uh, with hydrogen, and they were, you know, with these really primitive looking, sometimes even airline, airplane fuselages, like slung below them, really, I mean, completely exposed. But they did great duty over the uh, English Channel in the North Sea, spotting submarines. They actually they actually worked pretty well. And a lot of them went up in hydrogen fireballs too, but they were they were just these super primitive little things that, um, in some ways, they underscored the failure of the larger airships to work because the little battle bags. I mean, they worked pretty well. If what you were trying to do was to um, you know, one of the things that the British Expeditionary Force in World War One is always they were crossing the Channel, and of course in the Channel, meaning on boats, and in the Channel were U-boats, and so the, these little battle bags would go up there and they, they could they could spot spot the U-boats, which was one telling the British ships what to avoid, but also telling the British ships what to shoot at. Um, so yeah, that was their that was a, a really actually a successful use, and books have been written about the. The battle bags. There, I wish I, had a, I don't have a picture of them. They're just the funniest looking. They, they, uh, they look like pregnant slugs. <laughs> really, really bizarre looking things. But, uh, but again, with no superstructure at all. Um, and one of the reasons they kept their, they came up with this great system. So how do you keep? Well, the danger was that the balloon would collapse upon itself because it didn't have any support. So one of the things they did to keep the, the thing, inflated, is they they put a there's a propeller in the front of the thing that was slung on the little car, right? The propeller was propelling it. They would put a pipe right behind the elevator up into the airship, and it would blow air into the, into the, uh, into the envelope to keep it. And these things were incredibly primitive, but yes. Did you meet the man who sent you 7,000 Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. He got me the tour of Cardington, you know, where, where, the, air, where the sheds were. But they're still there, and this is funny. You guys will like this. So they're they're owned now by Warner Brothers, oh. and Batman was shot there. The first like one of the first Batman movies was shot inside. Because you can imagine what could be a better soundstage than a eight hundred foot long by one hundred and eighty foot high thing. I did. I got to go in and look up. They're 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 incredible. But he 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 got he got me that and. Uh, um, yeah, I met I met some of my airship guys, and there's this one one guy who, um, God, what is, talk about an eccentric, just a lovely guy, but he lives in this house. He's been collecting airship stuff since he was 11, and he lives in this house that is, it, it, it was the, the dirtiest house I've ever been in. It's <laughs> never been clean. It's just this deep in everything, and and you know with his wash hung down the you know his his, his laundry hung down the hallways and. I mean, you know, and I'm sitting there, and Nigel has the greatest private collection of airship um, documentation and documents and everything else, I think, anywhere. And But it's all just around this house, and it's stacked like, I mean, no, and I, I asked him, I said, Nigel, is this index? Do you have any kind of index to this? Which, I, of course, I knew the answer to, because even if you had an index, you wouldn't know that it was a foot from the end of his father's bedroom where his old his aging father is sitting upstairs in the middle of all that. Um, but I would sit down there and I would say, and he would say, well, what are you interested in? And this is up in um, Blackpool on the northwest coast of England. And uh, he would just leave and, and he, he knew where it was in his mind. And it, was, it was indexed in his mind. He knew where it was. And he would come down and bring me these like for example, that um, that great that incredible photograph of uh, of the Zeppelin over London with the spot. So yeah, that was from Nigel. I mean, I, I'd never seen nobody ever seen that before. He's got it up there somewhere. You know, brings it down and goes, "Well, what's that? Man? You might like this." You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Can I just have a, one other question? I'm struck that you were writing this during the COVID disaster. You mentioned folly, human folly. Yeah. Uh, that Barbara Tuckman book, The March of Folly, about every generation does something. And this comes uh, about 10 years after World War I, mass folly. It coincides with the Great Depression. It's eight years before World War II. And I wonder if, uh, 
a hundred years from now, people will talk about our era. We're like living in a giant carbon dioxide <laughs> zeppelin. And people will say, how come they couldn't see that they were destroying their own bubble with carbon and fossil fuels? I, I think mean, that's exactly it, it's, what... It's humbling, don't you think? We can say, how could they be so stupid? <laughs> Do you have any thoughts about what, our what, own what, airship what, going what, down? Yeah. <laughs> what, we're, what we're doing is on, on a planetary scale. I, that's what I'm saying. I mean, those guys are pikers. <laughs> These uh, guys so, are I doing... mean, we're destroying the planet. They just destroyed a few airships. Uh, yes, yeah, so they, they, it will, it will, we will look back and go, how could they possibly not have, yeah. you know, have responded? Um, yes, I believe they will. And I've, I've never seen more folly in my life. I mean what's going on right now, and I just follow everywhere. Uh, I, I mean, when I look at why the Russians have it, why the Russians are just dropping all those bombs on, on Ukrainian cities and killing innocent civilians, why are they, why, talk about, well, folly, I think it's gonna end up bringing the whole Russian empire down, bringing all, I mean, it was the stupidest thing anybody ever did. I mean, what Putin is doing is, everything about it is backfired on. But anyway, folly, 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 you know, global folly, global warming, whatever. Um, but yes, yeah, yeah. Has your book been released in the UK? Uh, not yet. I think I need to check on that. Uh, I have it. So the way it works is I have a UK publisher that's separate from Scribner. In fact, sells it to them. They'll put out the same book exactly. It has a different cover. Um, but uh, so we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. That it, it's a good publisher. We'll see if uh, it's really a. In a lot of ways, a British story, so it was, I would yeah. think British people would be interested. I can't. Yes, you had a question. Oh, I was going to say I can say uh, the audio book has a British author or a British person yes. reading it. Yes. So there's at least that. For well, me. I definitely I wanted a, a, a British person doing it. So it's a good audio book. Uh, did you listen to it or something? Uh, yes. I think that's addition... pretty good. Yeah, yeah, I did. I uh, tend to not like as much British uh, speakers, but this, I'm, I'm, yeah, this. Lord, and the books are changed my mind about my interest in British history, I think. So. I think he was the guy that did the Hillary Mantel. You guys, anybody know who Hillary Mantel is? Yeah. I think one of the most brilliant writers I've ever read in my life. She did the, she writes about Henry VIII and <coughs> Wolf Hall and these other books. But I think my guy is the guy who did the Wolf, mm -hmm. Wolf Hall books. But I sorry, I can't correct. Yeah, of the uh, 50 plus hydrogen fireballs that went down, how many of those ships were like actively uh, commercial passenger travels involved, or were they still experimenting on? Uh, the Hindenburg um, uh, passenger travel. Um, there was hardly any ever any real passenger travel in the sense of of, of, an, of, a, of a scheduled. What the Hindenburg was doing when it went down was a scheduled flight between you know uh, New Jersey and uh, wherever it was. So most of them were not. It was just like but they, yeah. So most, so most of it was, the, the bulk of it was combat. Then you had a bunch of zeppelins that just went up, and and uh, other ships that just went up in their sheds, in in flames. R one hundred one, of course. Uh, the uh, British airship R thirty eight, which was uh, which is an incredible story all by itself, but was a precursor of R one hundred one. But none of that was were passenger airliners. And so what, what the people who perished on, of the, I think I think there were 37 crew, 54 were on board um, R101, 37 were crew. And you had, it was mostly just the airship establishment people who were on that, so they weren't lay people. There were like three kind of representatives from Empire, one from Australia, one from India, one from somewhere else. But it was, they were, it wasn't, those weren't lay people um, on R101. And, uh, and so, yeah, it was always the goal of airship travel um, to have a regular kind of, you know, a, a passenger airline that might fly from wherever to wherever. So particularly, um, uh, you know, London, New York was a, was a big one, or, or Paris, New York, or, or uh, Berlin to New York was a big ambition. And the only, now ironically, the only thing that ever did that was the Hindenburg. And it had been doing it for a little while before it, Illustrated yet again that these things were a bad idea, because no one ever figured out to this day what the Hindenburg did. And one of the problems was is that the more the Germans insisted on it, was everything was perfect, everything was totally perfect, totally perfect, 
the more you said, well, then this is a really bad idea because if you can't think, if, if, if it's so perfect, you have absolutely no idea what made it do that, then I really don't want to go fly that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, we good? Yep, we're out of time, so thank you. All right. Thank you all for coming. More than you ever wanted to know about it. <laughs>